need to know how he does it. He has no choice. It's real. Christian Bale and Hugh Jackman compete for the title of the world's greatest magician in the prestige. I'm Richard Roper. Sitting in for Roger is the film critic from the New York Times, A.O. Scott. Welcome again, Tony. It's good to see you again. Good to have you, my friend. Okay, our first movie is The Prestige, and it's the second period piece magician film this season, and I thought it was even more entertainingly complex than The Illusionist. Christopher Nolan, the director of Batman Begins and one of my favorite movies, Memento, has created yet another dark, visually stunning original. The very impressive cast includes Hugh Jackman as Angier and the underrated Christian Bale as Borden. They're two apprentice magicians obsessed with topping one another personally and professionally. Michael Caine is their mentor. A real magician tries to invent something new that other magicians are going to scratch their heads over. I suppose you have such a trick, Mr. Borden. Eh? Yes, sure I do. Would you Ooh. care to sell it to me? No. No one else could do my trick. Any trick can be duplicated, right, Mr. Cutter? Wrong. Now, Borden is the more daring of the two, willing to risk his safety if it means winning over the audience and or his young wife. Go on, shoot me. <sighs> right there. No, I can't. No, no, not there. Shoot me here. That... Oh. <laughs> After an onstage fatality, Angier grows bitter. He becomes consumed with gaining revenge on Borden because he holds Borden responsible for that death. Borden winds up behind bars convicted of murder. <laughs> How do you get so famous then, eh? How'd you? Scarlett Johansson, apparently cast in about every third movie these days, does some nice work as Olivia, who falls in love with Angier, but is heartbroken when he sends her to Borden's camp as a spy. He's obsessed with discovering your methods. He thinks of nothing else. He takes no pleasure in our success, and I've had enough. There is no future with him. He sent me here to steal your secrets, but I've actually come to offer you his. This is the truth. Is it? Now, as the movie tells us, all great magic tricks have three elements. The pledge, or setup, the turn, where something extraordinary happens, and the prestige, or the reveal, when we see something we couldn't possibly have expected. The same could be said of movies like The Prestige. It's about the science and the art of magic, but it's also a three-part trick in and of itself. Pay attention. The pace may seem slow at times, but most of what appears to be padding will be revealed as vital to the story. Jackman and Bale give standout performances as rivals whose mutual obsession destroys all sense of perspective and ruins lives. For me, Tony, big thumbs up. This movie's a lot of fun. I give it thumbs up, too. Uh, I'm often a little bit suspicious of sort of gimmick movies with tricks and twist endings and all that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. this one handled it really well. And as you say, you, you have to pay attention to everything that's going on. And that's yeah. part of the fun. That's a real mm -hmm. pleasure in the movie, as are a lot of the performances. We yeah. have. I would single out also David Bowie, who appears as the mysterious uh, scientist this is Nikola Tesla, who's inventing some machinery yeah, in the mountains yeah, and of Andy Colorado. Circus from the Lord of the Rings oh, movie shows up yeah. and gives a great supporting performance. Yeah, a lot of good acting. And it's such, you know, Christopher Nolan, I just think, is a, a, a true original. He just brings a different approach to things. And his camera work, I mean, there's a lot of dark stuff here, but it feels authentic to the time. And we actually get an off-screen Thomas Edison kind of as a villain, which you'll just have to see the movie well, to understand. It's interesting, it. yeah, because there's, this there's the feud between these two inventors yeah. that's yeah. the kind of the real-life counterpart to the feud between the magicians. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting movie. Yeah, very, and I think very it, entertaining. You know, it's the kind of thing where to describe it to people, you don't want to give away too much. Uh, you know, and I think because it has such big stars, it'll draw people in. But I think it's really more about the art of storytelling and yeah. how movie magic and magic magic have a lot in common. Yeah, and, and I will say, Christian Bale, this is this is some of his best work. He's, he's really, he's really, really, good really good in this. Our next movie is Flicka, which is based on the classic novel My Friend Flicka by Mary O'Hara. It's the story of a headstrong girl's devotion to a headstrong horse. <laughs> Katie, played by Alison Lohman, is the daughter of a Wyoming rancher, played by the country singer Tim McGraw, a very rugged fellow. Mm. Katie's been kicked out of boarding school, nearly attacked by a mountain lion, and she and her dad just can't seem to get along. Here's your summer. You're going to do your chores, you're going to help your mother, and you're going to write that essay. And then maybe I can talk him into passing you. Yes, sir. And then maybe we'll talk about horses. But Katie defies her dad, and she tries to train that wild horse with the quiet encouragement of her mom, who's played by the wonderful Maria Bello. It's always good to see her, even when she must speak entirely in sentimental cliches. Sometimes I think I can't remember what I did yesterday. And then I swear I can remember every injury, every close call, every... 
Another angel they could have been killed that ever happened to my children. Alison Lohman is supposed to be spirited and indomitable. To me, she just seemed more like a brat. Although I was a little worried about the way she kept getting bruised and scratched up, because she keeps falling off that horse. <laughs> This is a well-intentioned movie. I don't want to be too hard on it. It's aimed mainly at the audience that went to see Dreamer with Dakota Fanning and Kurt Russell last year. But in spite of one exciting rodeo sequence and some very pretty horses, Flicka, I have to say, pulls up lame. Thumbs oh, down from me. You're like the mean rancher here, um, Tony. I'm actually giving this thumbs up to yeah, the glue it's factory. it's overblown, and yeah, it's very sentimental. I mean, everything you're saying is true, but that's what this is supposed to be, Tony. This is Flicka. This is my friend Flicka for the 21st century. It's got lovely vistas and earnest performances, and Alison Lohman, who I think is about 27, actually is very believable, I think, as a teenage girl. So, I mean, for what it is, I gotta say, I'm gonna give it thumbs up. I, I just felt like, for what it is, it didn't quite work. I do this as a kind of movie you don't necessarily expect subtlety and, and nuance no. and complexity. It is very strange when, when she's pretending to be a male cowboy with a little mustache that her brother draws on her she, with she charcoal. She looked a little bit like Johnny Depp there, yeah, actually. That's, 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 that's yeah, see, I, I, think, I think that that was kind of interesting, though. And, you know, the horses are gorgeous. The, the performances, I thought, were pretty strong. And, you know, with I all the junk was... that's out there for kids, I thought, well, you know, girls love their horses well, and they love this movie. I'd say this is maybe some of that junk. Okay, coming up next, Kirsten Dunst is... Marie Antoinette. Next is Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette. It's very pretty and occasionally amusing, but also dreadfully dull for long, long stretches. Kirsten Dunst has a Cupid doll girlishness that's well suited for the role of the naive teenager from Austria who becomes Queen of France through an arranged marriage to Louis XVI. And one of the many odd bits of casting, Jason Schwartzman, who's actually quite funny in the role, plays the young French ruler in waiting. Now, even more bizarre, here's Rip Torn as King Louis XV. Let me present my grandson, Louis Auguste. Welcome, madame. Now, King Louis Jr. is a disaster in the royal bedroom, and it takes seven long years for the marriage to be consummated. In the meantime, Marie Antoinette indulges herself like an 18th century Paris Hilton. The gimmick of using anachronistic music has been done and done better in films such as Moulin Rouge and A Knight's Tale. Here it just seems like filler to pad a very slow moving story. The French Revolution is almost an afterthought arriving deep into the third act. Coppola seems fascinated by the trappings of royalty, the ridiculously pompous ceremonies attached to everything from getting dressed in the morning to asking for a glass of water. But even with the gorgeous location shots and the stunning costumes, it's just tedious and limp. Marie Antoinette is a frothy milkshake with, I thought, no nutritional value. That would be a thumbs down. Off with your head, Mr. Roper. <laughs> I thought this movie was completely delightful and charming and, really? and very kind of touching, too. I mean, I think oh. that it's really about this girl. And, and I thought that, that Kirsten Dunst was, was charming and just had something, yeah. a real wit that she brought to it, who's trapped in this world of, of forms and, and appearances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's a movie about shallowness and superficiality, but I don't think that makes it a shallow or superficial movie. And and I mm. like actually the way that Sofia Coppola uses the mood and style and kind of pushes some of the story, some of the the, the, the more obvious approaches to the storytelling into the background. She doesn't push some of the story into the background, Tony. She pushes the story completely off the page. I thought. I mean, there are endless shots. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting to see this young girl, you know, trapped in this gilded cage and all that stuff. But I mean, it's endless shots of everything. I mean, at some point, with all the, it was like dessert porn. She kept, <laughs> you know, focusing on all these cake. treats and everything. Yeah, let them eat cake and all that stuff. And I just thought, oh, come on, we get it. Why do Marie Antoinette, if you're just going to make it about this kind of silly well, girl? Because it's not just yeah. about Marie Antoinette. It is about, I think mm. it's partly about Sofia Coppola. It's about living in this world. She grew up in Hollywood, as did Jason Schwartzman, her cousin. And, and you have Danny Houston in there, John Houston's yeah. kid, Asia Argento, another daughter of a famous filmmaker. And I think it is, it has a lot to say about the strange world of, of celebrity culture and, and contemporary materialism. Yeah, well, that's a lot of, you know, self-referential inside baseball that the average person, I think, doesn't care about. And maybe there is something there where, where Sophie is telling us about her life. But I just thought this vehicle was just limp and it was a real missed opportunity. I, I found it very 
very heartfelt. I was actually touched by it. Later in the show, Robert Downey Jr. and Rosario Dawson star in A Guide to Recognizing Your Saints. And next, Clint Eastwood's Flags of Our Fathers. If they throw their pennies on the stage for me, it's because they want them fluffed and folded and back by Friday. Looking at movies now in theaters, Robin Williams in Man of the Year got thumbs up for me, a thumbs down from Tony. Kate Winslet, who's so good, and Jennifer Connelly, everybody's great in this movie, Little Children, it got two thumbs up. And Toby Jones and Sandra Bullock in Infamous, that also got two thumbs up. Clint Eastwood turned 76 this past May, and at an age when a lot of guys would find themselves on the golf course in a comfortable retirement, he's at the top of his game as a filmmaker. There was Mystic River, which won a couple of Oscars in 2003, Million Dollar Baby, which won four the next year, including Best Picture, and now he's made Flags of Our Fathers, a big, complex, ambitious World War II movie. The first of two that he's directed, in fact, about the Battle of Iwo Jima and its aftermath. As far as us being the heroes of Iwo Jima, boo, boo, that's boo. just not the case. The real heroes are dead on that island. Flags of Our Fathers is really fundamentally about the gap between the way that war is experienced on the battlefield by the men fighting it and the way it's perceived by everyone else, the public, the government, the media, the people who aren't in combat. Yeah. On one hand, there's Image, the famous photograph in this case of a group of Marines and one Navy medical corpsman raising the American flag at Iwo Jima. And on the other, there's the reality of blood, death, fear, confusion. Caught right in the middle are three young men, wonderfully played by Jesse Bradford, Ryan Phillippe, and Adam Beach, who were there in that famous picture and who are brought home to the home front to use its fame to sell war bonds. Hank wasn't in the picture. Sorry? Hank didn't raise that flag. He raised the other one, the real flag. The what? The real, the real flag? There's a real flag? Yeah, ours was the replacement flag. We put it up and they took the other one down. <clears throat> Am I the only one getting a headache here? I wouldn't call this a perfect movie. It goes on a little bit too long. The last section, I think, drifts a little bit into a kind of sentimentality that the rest of the story hasn't prepared us for. But like Eastwood's other recent movies, it finds new sources of emotional power and moral complexity in a familiar genre. It also manages to be timely and thought-provoking without being too obvious or didactic about it. Big thumbs up for this movie. Yeah, big thumbs up for me as well, Tony. And you're right, though. There are, you know, you talk about a movie with modern-day parallels because we see with stories of, of brave Americans like Pat Tillman and Jessica yeah. Lynch that there's this media manufactured thing. And you're so right about Clint Eastwood. I mean, you know, Clint Eastwood, if he had never put on the poncho and been the man with no name, if he had never been Dirty yeah. Harry, if he had yeah. never stepped in front of a camera, his work as a filmmaker would make him one of the great contributors to America's American cinema. I mean, he's really sort of in the line of John Ford and the other mm -hmm. greats. I mean, like Ford, yeah. he makes movies about violence that, that are that are complicated, that are not, yeah. you know, simply critical or preaching or celebrating it, but about how Absolutely. violence, in this case war, is a fact of life, it's sometimes necessary, but it has all of these consequences. It does things to people that, that, that can't be simplified and can't be controlled. And, and it's a kind of movie, it's very, you know, his directing style is always very simple, straightforward. Yeah, he's not interested in wowing us with camera moves or anything. He's confident enough in his actors yeah. Yeah. and his storytelling abilities to just give us the story. Okay, next is A Guide to Recognizing Your Saints, this autobiographical debut from Dito Ma Montiel won awards at Sundance and has generated a lot of critical and industry buzz. And I gotta say, I mostly hated it. Despite the talents of the filmmaker and the ensemble cast, there was something so self-congratulatory and self-conscious about this movie. The miscast Shia LaBeouf plays Dito, and he seems more like a Nickelodeon version of a street tough in Queens circa 1986. Channing Tatum plays his best friend Antonia. The film's best performances come from veterans Diane Wiest and Chaz Palminteri as Dito's parents. You guys want to be Golden Gloves, you learn from the best. Up from the waist, right? down from the stop, chin. That's stop, Golden stop. Gloves. Yeah, okay. Stop it, okay. Seriously, I heard you told serious? us already. You serious? Come here. I'm glad to meet you, sir. Oh, that's a funny joke. It's I was five years old. Stop it. Robert Downey Jr. plays the adult Dito, who hasn't spoken to anyone in the neighborhood for 15 years. He returns home and reconnects with his former girlfriend, now played by Rosario Dawson. Wow. Wow. Lori, you look beautiful. You know, I'm in my best. I'm looking really good. My best slippers. You should see them, actually. Manolo's. Montiel tries to create empathy for these delinquents. For example, Antonio's a thug, but he's the product of an abusive home. 
but he's still a jerk who can barely string together six words. And there's a lot of frenetic camera movement as the soundtrack throbs with period piece 80s music. Now, there are some good performances, though Downey seems to be repeating mannered shtick we've seen him do before. Montiel has a feel for the neighborhood and a sense of family and neighborhood ties. But a guide to recognizing your saints, I feel, is a misfire. Well, as uh, one of the people who's been buzzing about it since Sundance... Uh, You're I, that guy, I aren't you? I remember buzz, reading buzz, something buzz. like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, you know, I, I see a lot of your points, but I just think this movie has such heart and sincerity and and I love to see a first time filmmaker mm -hmm. just kind of taking chances with the camera there's something very very just free and 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 lively about the way he uses the camera the way he stages the scenes just it's it's not even so much the story as just the kind of the the the, the chaos and ferment of daily yeah. life see, in Tony, this neighborhood I'm tired really of first time like... filmmakers trying to do something creative with the camera and in fact you mentioned people we we're just talking about Clint Eastwood and John Ford <laughs> you know there's a reason why the great directors are confident enough in their abilities not to be going now I'm going to do this and watch what I can do with that and look at this yeah. and I felt like that's what we were getting from this young director look at me look at me as a filmmaker instead of look at my characters and care about what oh, happens I, I, to them. I didn't find that. I felt, I felt really like the style was, was really organically co it, it, connected well, I, to the stories. And, really, and actually, I have uh, to say, Shia LaBeouf, I think, is a terrific young actor. I think he's really good in this. I think that the casting of him as the young guy and Robert Downey Jr., as as his older self, they're kind of they both have the same sort of nervous energy. It's one of the few times where I could see one actor and think, yeah, he might grow up to be that guy. Although he would no. grow up 15 years faster than Rosario Dawson, who's about it's, 20 years younger than Rosario. Yeah, well, that's but, what I was wondering too. When did Rosario Dawson become an age peer to Robert Downey Jr.? But that's that's a whole other thing about Hollywood, that's right? That's Hollywood, yeah. right? All right. When we come back, Jennifer Aniston and Vince Vaughn break up in the thumbs up video segment. But first, a look at what Chicago Tribune film critic Michael Phillips and I will be reviewing on next week's show. What are you guys doing? We need to go deep into his subconscious mind. Awesome. Oh. Why has been hurt? Is anybody a doctor? Is there a doctor? This week's Thumbs Up videos are brought to you by Raisinets. Make a deliciously smart choice with Raisinets. Sally can do. Yeah. You've been selected to perform on the show. <laughs> Looking at movies new on DVD, Hugh Grant and Mandy Moore in American Dreams. Amazing it got a thumbs up from Roger, a thumbs down from me. Bruce Willis and Wanda Sykes voice over the hedge. That got two thumbs up. And Lee Schreiber and Julia Stiles in the remake of The Omen. That got two thumbs up as well. And, Tony, my video pick this week is The Breakup, the Vince Vaughn, really? Jennifer Aniston movie. Really? Listen to you, <laughs> really. You know what? A lot of people like this movie, okay, and I'm, I'm one not, of them. And I, you know, I won't argue. I think it was uneven. I, I will give you that. But I like the idea of a romantic comedy that was sort of an anti-romantic, anti-comedy thing, kind of dark stuff. And, I like and the a lot idea. Of, a lot of the fight scenes, I thought, were, were almost too realistic. And also, uh, Vince Vaughn and his good friend, his old buddy, John Favreau, have some real nice scenes as best buddies. Well, you're obviously hurt about it. She got to you, you're hurt. You know, not, there's nothing to be ashamed of. She hurt you. Uh, will you look at me? I'm not hard. I'm a little shocked. I'm a little surprised. Yeah, you're devastated. Now, what's the name of the guy she's doing? And the DVD I'm also has an alternate ending, proving once again why most alternate endings were probably a bad idea <laughs> in the first place. So. My DVD pick this week is an oldie but a goodie, Sullivan's Travels, directed by the great Preston Sturges. This, I have to say, is one of my all-time favorite movies. Mm. It's available on DVD. It'll be part of a uh, Preston Sturges box set coming out later in the season. Um, I think it's just one of the funniest and one of the smartest movies about Hollywood. Joel McRae plays this... Um, you know, kind of hack director who's made these big silly hits, and right, uh, right. as we'll see in, in in a clip here, he wants to do something more important, more idealistic, more socially constructive. How about making ants in your plants of 1941? You can have Bob Hope, Mary Martin, maybe Bing Crosby, yeah, the dancers, maybe Jack Benny and Rogers, a big name band. What? Oh no, I want to make Oh Brother Where Art Thou. This is just one of the funniest and most satisfying movie comedies I think ever made. I could watch this. Oh yeah, it's a great film. Uh, the first time I saw it was actually in a film class in college, and I was just blown away by it. Okay, the breakup and Sullivan's Travels are both available now. Closed captioning for Ebert and Roper is sponsored by MovieTickets.com. Don't miss another show. Buy your tickets online at MovieTickets.com. Your own personal box office. Okay, recapping the movies on this week's show. Two thumbs up for The Prestige. We split on Flicka. We split also on Marie Antoinette. Two thumbs up for Clint Eastwood's Flags of Our Fathers. And we split on A Guide to Recognizing Your Saints. 
Well, Tony, I want to thank you so much for joining me in the balcony once again. And, you know, I, I, I'm hearing from people all the time asking how Roger's doing, and he's doing much better. And as a matter of fact, for a statement from Roger himself, you can go to our website, ebertandroper.tv, or go to Roger's website, rogerebert.com. Well, it's been great to be here, Richard. It's been a lot of fun, and I just want to say my thoughts are with Roger, and it's, it's a, a great honor, more than I can express, to, to sit in the man's chair. Well said. Okay, that's it for this week's show. Until next week, the balcony is closed.